Good morning, everyone. So I think we'll, we'll go ahead and begin. Um, full day ahead, so we should try to begin more or less on schedule. It is with profound gaiety and a sense of gratitude that I welcome our illustrious lineup of speakers, participants, as well as colleagues and students of St. Patrick's to this workshop on the triptych of analogy, desire, and imitation. A heartfelt Irish, Irish welcome to the workshop and to St. Patrick's Pontifical University. This open workshop is one of the major agreed outcomes of my grant project from the two million pound Widening Horizons in Philosophical Theology project headed by Professor Judith Wolf and King Ho Lung from the University of St. Andrews, liberally funded by the Templeton Religion Trust. Before turning to my grant project and the theme of this workshop, I would first like to give a snapshot overview of the project as a whole. As the vision statement says, quote, widening horizons in philosophical theology is a five-year collaborative initiative to advance philosophical theology by mobilizing the resources of the continental tradition of philosophy. Its basic aim is to empower philosophical theology in the continental tradition to pursue constructive and field building work in theology and to expand its potential. It pursues this aim by offering funding for up to 12 research projects, putting the project teams in conversation with each other and with other scholars." End quote. The vision statement further seeks to show that continental philosophy is, quote, necessary for theology because theological realities, like all realities, can be discovered and described only by methods that are attuned to their structures, end quote. This attunement to the theological realities under investigation finds a perfect interlocutor when continental philosophy, continental philosophy's predilection for openness and revelation is brought into view. As the statement says, quote, the questions that guide continental philosophy require a rigorous attentiveness to reality. It is a hallmark of continental thinkers, including Martin Heidegger, Jean-Luc Marion, and William Desmond, to understand being not as closed or inert, but as revelatory, and therefore as requiring openness, both in the sense of receptivity and reciprocity. Their methods are designed not only to understand this claim in the abstract, but also practically to enable the openness it demands." End quote. This attentiveness opens to the revelatory nature of reality that is the signature trait of continental philosophy, finds, it, finds its expression according to the vision statement in five predominant methods. One, phenomenology. Two, hermeneutics. Three, transvaluation. Four, genealogy. And five, engaging with the arts. After laying out a descriptive overview of the methods of continental philosophy, the vision statement then seeks to identify strategic areas of attention as to where philosophical theology within the continental tradition shows the greatest potential for widening and creative new discoveries. These areas are divided into methods, practices, and concepts. The two theological methods identified are apophaticism and resourcement. While the practices include doing metaphysics, spiritual practice, and fostering constructive conflict. And under the banner of concepts, one finds the scope of freedom, the concept of truth, sorry, the concept of life, the role of sin, the nature of information, and varieties of truth. The 12 grants were given to leading and emerging philosophers and theologians from the UK, Ireland, Belgium, Germany, the USA, Canada, and Australia, all of whom exhibit the potential to advance the vision statement and the strategic areas of constructive and creative widening. These projects include theological practice, inquiry, and poesis, professors Claire Carlisle and Karen Kilby, non-propositional concepts of divine revelation, 
phenomenology and hermeneutical perspectives, Professors Christina Gershwanter and Thomas, Thomas Schertel Trindle. Negative natural theology, freedom and the limits of reason, Professor Chris Ensel. Philosophical theology and the phenomenology of life, Professor Simon Oliver. Metaphysics, contemplation and the religious life, Professor von Erp. Sacred secularity towards a theology of the world, Agatha Billick Robson. From critique to character, Dr. Amber Bowen. Truth, Aquinas, and the theological turn in continental philosophy, Drs. Oliver Keenan and Scott DeHaan. Prophecy and orientation to life, Dr. Adam Morton, who's also attending this workshop. I don't see him this morning, but welcome, Adam. And hermeneutics and transcendence towards a synthesis, Dr. Darren Sirisky. From just one hearing of the projects, what is immediately evident is the diversity of themes. Yet despite this diversity, at a workshop held in Vienna in this, this past January, a polyphony of consensus began to emerge as to what the projects hold in common. Namely, what unites the projects is an indifference to a sharp distinction between philosophy and theology, and that indeed all of these projects are feverishly working at the borderlands between philosophy and theology. Situating my own project entitled Analogical Metaphysics and Incarnate Mimetic Desire in its relation to the vision statement, its continental approach sits within the method of transvaluation, while its theological method is one of ressourcement that is concerned with the second phase of this movement, which accents the constructive future while my practices are doing metaphysics understood as a spiritual practice. And the central concepts I treat are freedom and sin. The major agreed outcome uh, is a monograph provisionally titled Prologue to Metaphysics of Patmos, Analogy, Desire, and Imitation. This book can be described as a thinking towards a philosophy of Christianity or more specifically, a metaphysics of Christianity cast in a Johannine hue. Its central point of reference and inspirations are the writings of St. John from Prologue to Apocalypse. A metaphysics of Patmos is a Christocentric rendition of the Analogia Intis and must be understood as symbolic shorthand for a Christian philosophy of history calibrated by the Analogia Intis recast, um, sorry, uh, analogia, and analogia Inti is apocalyptically recast and unfolded in its incarnate and desirously mimetic dimensions. The monograph is divided into five chapters, provisionally ordered and titled Chapter 1, Towards a Metaphysics of Patmos, a Programmatic and Synoptic Overview. Chapter 2, Christ the Fourfold Analogical Event on the Commandment and Practice of Loved in Fleshed Mimesis. Chapter 3, On the Johannine Spirit. Chapter 4, The Christic Drama, Nietzsche and Christian Transvaluation. Chapter 5, Christic Mimesis in the Apocalyptic Artistry of Dostoevsky. Part of, the, part of Chapter 1 was presented at last year's The Future of Christian Thinking Conference and has since appeared in Church Life. Part of chapter two is being presented tomorrow, and this presentation will al also likewise appear in Church Life. Chapter three will establish the Johannine spirit of the book in critical dialogue with Michel Henri's trilogy on Christianity, which also lays claim to the Johannine spirit. Part of chapter five has appeared in Church Life and is a wide ranging engagement with Nietzsche and transvaluation, and part of chapter Five is also appearing in Church Life and treats the Christic and apocalyptic drama in Dostoevsky's novel, novels, Crime and Punishment, The Idiot, The Demons, and Brothers Karamazov. By now, the reason for the theme of the workshop should be evident enough in relation to my constructive project. But if the project spirit is Johannine, why invite, broadly speaking, analogical thinkers along with representatives of mimetic theory? The answer is twofold. First, 
the companions, to borrow from William Desmond, of my projects are no doubt analogical thinkers in the wake of Shivara and Desmond's metaxological elective affinity with Shivara, along with Girard's theory of mimetic desire. However, neither Shivara nor Girard will directly or extensively be treated in the book. So why representation of the two styles of thinking at this workshop? On my reading, these two sources offer the deepest interpretive gateways into the truth of the Joannine corpus. Said otherwise, this spirit, their spirit is, broadly speaking, Joannine. Second, if the overall project is about widening horizons, what better way to do so than by bringing two styles of thinking together that more often than not are regrettably silent towards one another? What can an analogical or a metaxological metaphysics say to mimetic theory and vice versa? I suspect more than meets the eye. This is what this workshop is about. I conclude by expressing profound gratitude to Judith and King for their show of trust in my project's potential for constructive and creative widening. I hope I do not disappoint. A thank you to the Religion Templeton Trust for their generous funding, as well as to, uh, to the other recipients of the grant, some of whom I knew before, others I met for the first time. The conversations and friendships are already bearing much fruit. And lastly, and certainly not least, I thank Sean Palmer, my research and administrative assistant for this grant. Um, without him, this workshop and project would be infinitely more laborious and thus less enjoyable. So welcome and let us begin the dialogue. Thank you. So uh, it is my great pleasure to open our first session and introduce our first speaker of the morning to you, um, Dr. William Desmond. Dr. William Desmond is the David Cook Chair in Philosophy at Villanova University and Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at the Institute of Philosophy, Catholic Universität Leuven. He was, until this year, the Thomas A. F. Kelly Visiting Chair in Philosophy at Maynooth University, National University of Ireland. His work is primarily in metaphysics, ethics, aesthetics, and the philosophy of religion. He is the author of many books, including the trilogy Being in the Between, Ethics in the Between, and God in the Between. Most recently, he has published God Sense, From Default Atheism to the Surprise of Revelation. He is past president of the Hegel Society of America, the Metaphysical Society of America, and the American Catholic Philosophical Association. He is the recipient of Doctor of Literature Honoris Causa from Maynooth University. Dr. Desmond's presentation for us today is entitled Mimesis, Desire, and the Porosity of Being. Um, please welcome me very sincerely in welcoming Dr. William Desmond. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew, for introducing me. And uh, I also want to give my thanks to Philip Gonzalez for the invitation and to Sean Palmer also for his superb organization uh, in not just merely uh, senses of efficiency but also in terms of hospitality and welcome. And I'd like also of course to thank the Maynooth community in the larger sense for the sense of hospitality that also is, uh, it, 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 it recurs and recurs in all of my visits here to Maynooth, so my thanks. Uh, I, I, when I got the invitation, I wrote the paper very early on, and of course, when you write things at my age, you forget them after a while, and um, 
I have been focusing my mind on some of the essential points in the paper itself. I wasn't sure how much access the participants would have to the papers, uh, given that it's called a workshop. I thought that people would have perhaps access to them, and uh, then that would determine the kind of response that I might offer this morning. So I'll read some paragraphs, I'll extemporize, I'll not be able to read as much of the paper, it's too long. Um, uh, but I, since coming here, the Girardians, or those very interested in Girard, are very notable by their presence. I have some remarks to some degree in passing in the paper itself, but they're systematically undergirded by certain considerations, um, both with reference to the difference between desire in a Girardian sense and desire in a Hegelian sense. But I leave that uh, to the side for the moment, but I have three sections. One of them is called mimetics. The second section is called erotics or desire. And the third uh, section is called the porosity of being. But I thought that perhaps at least to open, I might read a few paragraphs on mimetics because the notion of mimesis has made a return of a significant form, of course, with Girard. But it strikes me as a philosopher, or at least as trying to be a philosopher, that the very um, meaning of being imitative uh, requires uh, reflection and investigation at perhaps levels of consideration that uh, don't always occur, in fact, and perhaps haven't uh, adequately occurred throughout the long philosophical tradition itself. So, again, I can only read uh, some of what I have to say, but let me begin. Uh, the idea of mimesis might initially be connected with reflections on the nature of art, reaching back into ancient times and extending especially into the end of the 18th century. Many of us are familiar with the discussion of art as imitation in Plato and Aristotle, and it is worth reiterating that mimesis has been the major idea relative to which the significance of the aesthetic and the artistic has been understood for more than two millennia. The change occurs towards the end of the 18th century when notions like originality and creativity displace the primacy of mimesis. There's much involved in this shift and a very large part of the cultural formation of modernity, and indeed I think post-modernity since then, has been shaped by stress on the primacy of notions like originality and creativity. This has many dimensions of significance and importance, not least in how we understand the nature of human desire and the unleashing of erotic energies that in previous times were kept within the measure of a certain moral considerations. It has to be remembered, however, that the notion of mimesis itself does make reference to originals. Any understanding of mimesis has to take into account the difference of image and original. An imitation is an image of an original, which in the older understanding is not produced by the image itself. The original stands with a self-subsistence that cannot be reduced to the images that imitate it. This has again many dimensions, and while one is tempted primarily to think of its relevance to aesthetics and art, there are deeper levels of consideration bearing on mimesis with implications for metaphysics and indeed theology. I am thinking of how the world and everything in it, being and all beings, are themselves understood as imaging an origin, an original, an original which they themselves do not create or produce, but which in complex ways shows them to be creations of this more original origin. I'm referring to the doctrine of creation. But there is a metaphysical mimetics embedded in the demiurgic claim in Plato's Timaeus that the entire cosmos is a certain, it is necessary in fact that the entire cosmos is a certain icon. Besides metaphysical and theological issues, the ontology of image and original also has pedagogic, ethical, and political considerations of importance. Again, I will summarize here, we're familiar with Aristotle's ethics, for instance, and it's very, very clear there that uh, ethical education, or paideia in that fuller sense understood by the Greeks, is impossible without beginning in imitation. It may not end simply in imitation, but without beginning in imitation, 
There is no uh, ethical paideia at all. Um, mimetics has social and political significance insofar as imitation in many ways is inseparable from our being in relation to others and in others being in relation to ourselves. Now, I would like to stress again in the, uh, uh, any understanding of, image and, uh, of imitation, the sense of difference, difference between the image and the original is essential. The difference can be presented as a potential dualism between the original and the image. And if we stress uh, imitation in this more dualistic way, we can easily separate the image and an original in such a manner that the image is seen as falling away from, let's say, true beauty, true being, and true goodness. This is one of the ways in which Plato has been presented, though I think it risks a simplification of his complex vision. The stress on the difference, the otherness, the transcendence of the original is not simply intended to produce but a depreciation of the mimetic image, but to draw attention to its derivation from something other and more than itself. It is not self-derived. Its being in relation to what is beyond itself governs its power to manifest something of an order of being that cannot be, cannot be univocally reduced to a finite set of imminent manifestations. Now, I think that this double possibility of the Im imitation as potentially uh, concealing or perhaps even dissimulating the original, but also as potentially manifesting and uh, communicating something of the truth of the original. That doubleness is very, very important, I think, in defining what, to me, is a between space between image and original that is uh, uh, open to being diversely traversed in mimetic uh, relation. The in-between space might be seen as the source of the above-mentioned the, the, the above -mentioned displacement from er, er, mimetics to originality, that, which I began at the beginning. Uh, or it, mean, it, mean, it might mean something like this. If there is a constitutive beyondness to the original, then our derivative status will also be constitutive of what defines us to be what we are. We are not absolute originals. We are not the absolute original. The difference between our potential originality and unconditional originality must always remain open. One can see how this might smart our sense of ourselves as at least potentially original. I'm thinking of something like this as shown in a very revealing statement by Raldo, Ralph Waldo Emerson, quotation, imitation is suicide. This statement embodies many of the issues at stake in the transition from mimetics to originality. And I explain a little. Imitation is always imitation of another. Without the other, the imitation is nothing, because nothing, being nothing is not being oneself. To commit oneself thus to being nothing in imitation is to kill oneself. I, I'm channeling uh, an Emersonian possibility. The, Emerson is perhaps more complex than what he sometimes says, but that's another issue. Suicide. Suicide is a crime against oneself, a crime against a, a life that, in fact, makes a claim for itself, a claim that is not derived from something other than itself, a claim that has to be lived and that potentially can become the singular mark of a whole life. Something of Emerson is, and others are, is present in that way of putting it. One can see how this train of thought can lead to a sense of elevation in the worth and dignity of the human being. We, we are something for ourselves. We're not to be derived from something other than ourselves, not simply. The difference of the image and the original turns over in a direction other to what previously was thought to govern mimetic derivation. Mimetic derivation does not seem to do adequate justice to the fact that something about our lives is derived from ourselves and not from what is other than ourselves. Uh, so, the turn from mimetics to originality from the late 18th century onwards is a very important tale to be told and bound up with developments in our understanding of what transcendence and our own self-transcendence mean. It can lead, and this, this is a question, it can lead to a weakening of the sense of transcendence as other, coupled with an accentuation of a sense of our own being as self-transcending. 
This can lead to a hyperbolic sense of our own purported creativity, unloosed from being in relation to what is more than ourselves. This latter unloosing can take the form of an anti-religious hostility to divine transcendence and to an anti-naturalist hostility to the given conditions of nature that define our being as what it is. In the earlier stage of the transition to originality, the first hostility was more stressed, but the second hostility is now more manifest in the wake of the so-called death of God with implications for how we relate to the very ecology of imminent life itself. There's something paradoxical here. On the one hand, a growing sense, and this is the imminent ecology of life, a growing sense that the constancies of the ecology of nature require of us a renewed respect that has been neglected for centuries. On the other hand, an increasing mania for the reconstruction of the human being in terms that reject the very givenness of the constancies of nature, such that, for instance, the biological difference of the male and the female is transcended. On the one hand, a growing sense that the constancies of nature require a new piety, on the other hand, an increasing impiety in relation to granting the constancies that define our own nature as given to be and gifted to us as given to be. So I think this is not unconnected with, in some quarters certainly, the attractiveness of Girard's discovery that mimetics itself is constitutive in relation to human desire with huge implications in many different directions which have been taken up by those who have seen uh, what might be of uh, promise in uh, Girard's uh, stress on things. Now, uh, just a, a few more words on uh, imitation. One of our tendencies in modernity is to think, think of imitation as something like a static copying. As a static original, we copy it. The uh, original stands there, let me say, we take a facsimile or a photocopy of it or a photo of it. And it is thought that there's a one-to-one -one relation between the uh, uh, imitation and the original. So it's a, it's a very reductive sense of mimetics, both on the side of the uh, original to be copied and on the side of the image doing the copying. But I think that you have to stress what I call the betweening, uh, the, that between space that is mimetics itself and hence takes into account a dynamic interplay or a dynamic intermediation, which stress here also on the dynamism as much on the sense of the inter or the between. And I just want to just give, uh, this is of course very relevant to the mimetic sense of desire because there are, no, there are no static originals and static copies. You're dealing again with an intermediation and a self-mediation and the mixing of self-mediation and intermediation. But I give an example in the paper which tries to open up the sense of mimetics. Uh, I cite older members here might remember he was a, a, a he had his day in the sun, Marcel Marceau, the, one of the great mimes of the 20th century. And uh, if you're, you can go to YouTube and find him performing certain uh, mimes. Uh, there's one that I particularly like and that is to be found called The Cage, where he's simply on a stage, but he says nothing. By bodily gesture, he creates the cage and what it means to be in the cage. Um, and, of course, that it is a cage is not itself without its own latent um, uh, suggestions. But uh, by doing nothing, almost, he brings to be uh, something. Um, and that's, a, that's, that's, that's an imitation in this more ecumenical sense that I'm trying to um, uh, communicate. It's interesting, too, that the sense of mimesis, even in the Greek context of someone like Plato, it was thought that music was the most imitative of the arts. The example that is used in the Republic is painting, but in fact, music is the most imitative. Music is, in one sense, the most fluid and also perhaps the most formal art from the point of view of form and fluidity itself. And yet, how mime fluidity 
since fluidity is what it is in passage? Um, there are very interesting questions to be put to uh, what to me is a richer exploration of the very nature of mimetic activity itself. So I, I, I'm, I'm trying to give a sense of how mimetic, mimetic behavior, and this is a paragraph, is subtended by original power to become what is other to oneself. The becoming that does not abrogate the difference between self and other, but shows the intimate permeable interiority that can assume something of the being of what is other to itself and present it in an original way, in a new way. I think that this is only possible in terms of what I call the porosity of being that marks our own being at a level that is ontologically constitutive, constitutive but that also is at a level prior to the determinate formations of one's own self prior also to determinist relations between oneself and others. Since as an enabling opening, there would not be at all, there would not be anything at all but for it. So I've, I've, my third section is on this sense of the porosity of being. But there's a deeper level of ontological considerations to make sense of becoming other to oneself and becoming the other to oneself, that mimetics in this richer sense uh, instantiates. Okay. Just one final point um, uh, on mimetics. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind, nevertheless, that in terms of the open dynamic of betweening, what may begin as an image can in due course take on features of originality for itself. So any dualism strictly fixed, fixated between image and original, in fact, uh, is, is inadequate. The truer an imitation becomes, the more it becomes an original for itself. This is again an indication that a dualistic either or between image and original in the fixation of mimetics as a univocal relation of copying does not do justice to the, the dynamic movement between image and original. An original image cannot be fixed simply as either an image or original. Mimetic betweening allows a certain enhancement, so to say, of the image in more original terms. I think this has in theological significance insofar as the, given being, as, the, as the given being for self that constitutes the creature cannot be separated from the endowment that is enabling of the creature to be itself and to be for itself. The talent is not simply to be buried. So there's potentially a principle of newness and originality in a mimetic relation also, which tells against many of the standard ways in which uh, mimesis is presented, and that is epitomized for me, in fact, in uh, Emerson's statement when he says that uh, imitation is suicide. I have a long section on uh, erotics and desire. I explain my own interests in desire from one of the first books I published many years ago called Desire, Dialectic, and Otherness. Um, the sense of emergent infinite restlessness within human desire, I think, is of great, absolutely central significance. That it's impossible to univocalize human desire, certainly not, way, not in the way animal desire can be more or less univocally fixated, fixed between a need and a fulfillment a certain infinity, infinitization emerges in the unlimited restlessness of human desire. This is something so well known by a figure like Augustine. Uh, and it's present, I think, also in the older Platonic sense of the erotics of the soul as oriented to something more than simply the finite horizon of uh, mortal existence. But again, that's a question that I touch on in this particular section, but I don't have time to say much about it here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm turning pages. There's great stuff there, but unfortunately, my, my vanity is overruled by my sense of responsibility to you as early morning listeners. Um, uh, 
this complexification of desire is expressed in the fact that desire is essentially equivocal. You know, uh, this is again the doubleness coming back. I don't say that that's the end of the story, but it's something that we have to traverse and enter into, just as the doubleness of mimesis is also equivocal and not just merely univocal. Doubleness enters the space of a possible duplicity, and this is one of the reasons I think that many religious and philosophical traditions look with a certain negative eye on our very being itself as desire. There's something dissimulating and deceptive about our desiring, since it's never univocally clear what, in fact, the true object of desire is. This is evidently so in the domain we normally understand as eros. Our desiring of the other seems to go out from us towards the other, but sometimes it is coiled around itself in an entrancement that is neither of oneself nor the other. And even though one thinks that it is the look of the other that has precipitated one into the love, any precipitation itself is not really intelligible without the prior porosity that places us in this space of opening, and hence of eros rising or falling, of eros being exalted or being crushed. We are opened before we open ourselves, but it is not simply the human other that opens us, it's our very being itself to be opened. We experience this in a particularly intense way in adolescence, when on the one hand, we become more intensely self-conscious, and on the other hand, we become more feverishly aware of the other that draws desire outward. Yet it is the transformation of the porosity into a more explicitly erotic form that affects the equivocal complexification of our selving. There is another doubleness to the equivocity of eros. There is the equivocity of a, in, in a potentially duplicitous form, but there is also the equivocal in a saturated sense, in which a certain too muchness in the betweening promises as much heaven as hell. The saturated equivocity might be described in terms of the ancients' efforts to distinguish between the different forms of eros, particularly the difference between eros uranios, the heavenly eros, and eros tyrannos. Uh, the tyrannical form of eros. Now again, I think that these are very important things for uh, uh, mimetics also, and a, 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 as, as a, a very sympathetic and interested reader in Girard also, entering into the coiling around of eros in itself, in mimetic uh, behavior. Uh, let's see, let's see now. Gerard, again, just in deference to our concerns here, Gerard importantly draws our attention to the desire of the other. This is something triadic, one might say, there is something triadic about this desire of the other, not only our desire of the other, but the desire of the other itself, and our desire of the desire of the other. If we pay close attention to this, we begin to see a kind of fractal complexification and intensification in the very nature of human desire itself. There is more and more intricacy in it, the more and more we descend into the intimacy of its articulation. Triadic mimetics carry signs of an infinite openness beyond tripl triplicity. There are places where Girard talks about metaphysical desire and I'm not entirely sure what he means by this. It does, mean some, it does have something to do with the desire for being, a desire to be. This, I sense, is not developed in a more systematic, in more systematic philosophical terms, so it's hard to be entirely sure of what is intended. I do take him to mean that our desire itself cannot be separated from its participation in the event of being itself. Our desire as a participation of being is both an instantiation of the power to be as well as reaching out to being as other to itself. And perhaps also the discovery that what is other to itself is already the companion within the incognito unfolding of desire that takes itself only to be for itself alone, mistakes itself. I mentioned this briefly to draw attention to a certain fruitful area of contrast between Girard's notion of desire and Hegelian desire. The constitutive participation of the other to self in the unfolding of the desire of this self for the other, this could be a way also of approaching the Hegelian sense of desire as a desire for recognition. 
we do not desire the object. We desire the recognition of the other who also desires the object, making it desirable for us because it is desired by the other. We do not desire things. We desire to be granted worthiness to be recognized in the possession of things the other desires. Again, it, it, perhaps this can come up for uh, discussion, but the whole sense of Hegelian desire is uh, made intelligible by him. He believes it's made intelligible by him by a logic of negation. And uh, uh, there's more in my paper that I say about this than I can perhaps uh, cover in the time that I've, I, have, I have here today. But I would say Hegelian negativity is not enough to give an account of betweening, either in desire or in mimesis. Betweening is a being in relation which is plurally intermediating rather than holistically self-mediating. And while negativity is like the porosity, the latter cannot be defined by negation simply. Lack does not exceed itself. There is an affirmative energy, an energy affirming being that desires to be beyond lack and that moves lack beyond lack, while being not just lacking. There is an enabling opening, patient in itself, but energized to take form in more determinate and self-determining desires. But there is always something more than determinate and self-determining desires. Again, there's, there's, there's much that could be said about the, the bedrock, that it's not a bedrock at all because it's nothing, that Hegel builds his whole, whole system on a, he calls it self-relating negativity. And I'm trying to say that Hegel doesn't himself penetrate deeply enough into the significance of negativity because negativity, qua negativity, in fact, can't move itself or move beyond itself. And we need uh, uh, to move to this level of what I call the porosity of being and what that implies. My time is up, right? Um, I have only gone through two thirds of my paper. I now come to porosity, but that's all right. You're a forgiving audience. Um, I won't say anything about it except I'll go to the last page of my. See, this is this is a, this is a continuing occurrence for me when I am saving the universe by printing on both sides. I find Where's myself. Page? No, I found this actually. Okay. It's here actually. Uh, this sense of the, you, you, we can talk about this, but this 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 more original porosity of being in one sense looks like nothing. What is it? A poros? I, I connected with the sense of poros actually in the the genealogy of eros in, in Plato's uh, symposium, but, and there's more to be said about this. Um, but while this is not acknowledged necessarily, it doesn't mean that it's not in play. It's not out of play. The almost nothing, and I'm reading the last couple of paragraphs in my thing, and that'll be enough. The almost nothing character of the porosity could well be connected with the sense of inspiration that is one of the sources of our own more contemporary stress upon originality. I think one could give an account of mimesis also in terms of such a sense of inspiration, again, such that one would have to reject Emerson's, Emerson's claim mentioned earlier that imitation is suicide. A suicide is only possible if life is already coursing through a given being. Suicide itself presupposes this being given to be prior to the act of negation by means of which life is terminated. What is presupposed as given to be points us back to the breath of life itself. What is breathed into us to make us into living beings in the first instance and breathed into us in the second instance to make us more definitely creative human beings. One remembers the biblical image of the breathing into the humus by God and by this kissing of the mud, the transformation of earth into the living human being. Our first breath is our being gifted with being at all. Our last breath is our passing beyond the boundaries of finite imminence. Between first and last breath, we are haunted by a sense of non-being with which we must wrestle. Wounded wrestling with this non-being enters a second time into the very definition of what it means to be a porous being within the imminent between, in the mortal between. Inspiration like breath is like the porosity, given that breath is almost nothing. We may see it as something on a very cold morning, 
but for the most part, we take the inhalation and ex exhalation of breath supremely for granted. What is almost nothing enables the sustenance and continuation, and indeed the prospering of life itself. Stop the breath and death comes. Breath being breathed is our stay against death. This way of speaking might seem too negative. My, this is my final lines. Same too negative, a description of what's at stake, tending towards the anxious and the protective rather than the affirmative and the festive. Picasso said somewhere that a work of art is a sum of destructions. I would add, a sum of destructions is not itself a destruction if it is a work of art. What is the more? It is the affirmative and the festive breath that enters into the inspiration of original works of art, gifted to human beings by a companioning source more often not even acknowledged or named as such. As little acknowledged and named as the breath of air we need for life and without which we die. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Desmond. And uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Grant Kaplan to give a short response. Thanks. Um, uh, Dr. Desmond, um, the parts that weren't read uh, also have a lot of uh, excellent insights into um, the topic and certainly into the thought of Rene Girard. Um, I'm just going to speak viva voce and make, um, I think, seven points, some maybe only one or two sentences long, so don't, don't worry. I think I'll, I'll come in well under 10 minutes. Um, the first, I, I like what you said about porosity of being, and I really do think even if you qualify it as a workshop paper, it's nonetheless an excellent paper. Um, this porosity of, uh, I think, corresponds pretty closely to what Girard calls intersubjectivity. So the, 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 who we are as individuals, as subjects, is so bound up with the other that he, I think it's the, one of the only words he invents. Um, the second point, I just want to dwell a little bit on Emert, Emerson's statement. Um, I mean, it really is the, the height of what Girard would call romantic deceit. And if I had known this statement before I wrote a lot of the stuff I wrote about Girard, I would have used it all the time because it captures it so perfectly. And the suicide in the, in, in the imitation, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not so much that um, once one finds oneself to be imitating another, one may as well kill oneself. It's more that in the act of imitation, you've already killed yourself because you're not an individual. Yourself has been killed by imitation. And uh, one sees this, um, uh, you, you know, the, the romantic desire to cling to this originality and the romantic notion of love, which even though we're a long time from the romantic period, it's still in, in all the movies, you know, it's, it's there's someone walking down the street and there's that gaze, uh, and all of a sudden, one, one falls in love in a way that you saw in that other person the beauty, and that you made this decision to, to fall for this person. Well, I mean, it negates the entire notion that we have a standard of beauty that's, that's given to us, and you, you know, uh, what, what um, Tolstoy would have found beautiful about Anna Karenina in the 19th century, m most people today would not, and there's, uh, you know, the, the reverse uh, male, what makes a male attractive, and so, um, but uh, the, the romantic wants to forget all this and pretend as if um, the desire for the other is, is purely something that bubbles up within the self's own originality, authenticity, um, and uh, will we'll cling to this to the, to the very end. And in fact, um, you know, the love triangle is something we've 
Girardians talk about a lot and it gets talked about a lot. And it's almost like, Girard never says this, but I think he might agree that the love triangle, all relationships are really love triangles. It's just not all of them have in fact been played out. Um, so uh, the third point, um, you know, when you talk about the human being as given, I think it's um, just a parallel to this would be Hannah Arendt's notion of natality and that um, just the, in other words, the idea that um, we, are, we are given life. We don't originate ourselves. And this is one of the, the great mysteries. And everybody who's been a teenager, I think most of us have. Um, Cyril, maybe not. Uh, he was never, no. Uh, most of us have been te teenagers. And, um, you know, at one point we told our parents, I never asked to be born. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, I did. I'll, I'll come out and confess it. And so this, this, uh, this idea of, you know, you, you aren't really a, a, an, ind an, uh, you know, a, an, a, an individual, a subject that, uh, that is, is unrelated to others. Um, the fourth idea, uh, just, you didn't, I mean, you talked about it a lot more in the written form of your paper is, the connection between Girard and Hegel. And um, for Hegel, and you're right, obviously, that you say that the desire is a desire for recognition. And that's where the other comes in. And Girard talks about Hegel um, most in the last book, Battling to the End, in the chapter on Clausewitz and Hegel. And it's really quite insightful. Um, earlier, he, he tended to be a little bit more negative toward Hegel, I think, I'm pretty sure his Hegel was very much the Kojev Hegel that a, a French intellectual would have picked up if they were born and studied the time Girard did in France. Um, and uh, there the focus, the key to unlocking the phenomenology of spirit, uh, where, where Hegel's really best on desire and the other, is, of course, the master-slave dialectic. Um, and that's the, the way, you know, if we don't read the phenomenology of spirit, we, we just read those, you know, five or seven pages or whatever it is, and it's just, okay, now I get where Marx was getting this from, and it's the one, the one thing we can quote from, from memory uh, from the phenomenology. But I think there's good reason to believe that the section on, that's very short uh, also on, um, Forgiveness and reconciliation, you could make a good argument that's the key for un, unpacking all of Hegel and re, re, recent, uh, or all of the phenomenology. Recent scholars like Molly Farneth have, have made this claim in her book, Hegel Social Ethics. Um, so, but that desire for recognition, I mean, for Girard, the person who gets it exactly right is Dostoevsky. And the heart of Dostoevsky for Girard is notes from the underground, the underground man. And so it's, it's that scene when the officer goes into the, the bar and sort of knocks shoulders with the protagonist and uh, startles him. And he doesn't even turn around to say that he's sorry for doing this. Um, and uh, it bothers the protagonist so deeply. He's so upset by it. And he keeps on replaying this event. And then by the end, it's not even clear whether it actually happened or whether he just dreamed it up as a reason to resent this person. But it, it encapsulates this, this sense of non-being, a kind of non, uh, uh, yeah, a non-being. So when Gerard talks about metaphysics, a metaphysical desire, I mean, one thing he says is all desire is a desire for being. And you're right that he never really unpacks it. I mean, Gerard sometimes offhandedly could come off as a bit of a philosophobe. I think if you probed him a bit, he usually was more um, circumspect. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the um, fifth point on human and animal desire, I mean, Gerard just terminologically, I think he refers to it as appetite. So humans have appetite, you know, uh, the hunger, or thirst, these kinds of things, and that's on a kind of animal level that's before the enculturated notion of, of uh, mimetic desire. Um, the Eros stuff's interesting, six points. Um, 
I don't think Girard's very good on Eros. You know, when Aristotle says at the beginning of the metaphysics, all human beings desire to know, um, that, that kind of intellectual Eros, Bernard Lonergan translates it, this into what he calls the pure and unrestricted desire to know. And I don't know if you can get there with Girard um, because uh, his focus on, um, uh, on, on just the other being so uh, primary or prior to in any of our desires. Um, I, I'm not sure how you square that. Um, Wolfgang or Michael may tell us in the Q&A. Um, and the last point, uh, I mean, I love what you said about the restless heart uh, in Augustine and uh, that sense of restlessness. Gerard says in a late interview, you know, three quarters of what I say, Augustine, uh, you know, it's already in Augustine. And so he sees himself really as an Augustinian um, some Girardians don't really pick up on that or see all the connections, uh, I, would, I would argue that way. And um, just, I think, de Lubach's notion of the supernatural um, would be a kind of modern way to correlate that, and I won't try to unpack it here because I think everybody um, probably wants to ask questions. But thank you again for a wonderful paper. I thought it was very fine. Um, and. Uh, um, that's it. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Dr. Kaplan. Um, Dr. Desmond, would you like to respond before I open it up for questions? Uh, and, and the, these are very helpful uh, points of contrast and illumination. I, I really think they're very, very, very full of acumen and to the point. I would just say one thing about Hegel and forgiveness. Uh, there are a group of Hegelians that want to n not acknowledge really that the ultimate logic in Hegel is a, is a, is a, is a, is a mediation with the other. But it, the, in the end, it's always a circular self-mediation which mediates with self through the other, even at the level of the absolute. And that famous section in Evil and Its Forgiveness in the Phenomenology, which is <clears throat> just at the time of transition to the religious in Hegel's view, it's beyond the moral view, uh, and I think Hegel has something to say to Kant on that particular score in relation to morality and religion. But if you look closely at the text in Hegel, it's, it's in my view, systematically equivocal as to whether this is the self-forgiveness of Geist understood as the unitary power that brings the opposites back into relation with them, or whether, it, from certainly the human point of view, it's genuine forgiveness where there's another uh, that stands with that being for itself, fully for itself. I, I think you would have to give what I would call him a taxological account of forgiveness to do justice to being forgiven by the other and forgiving the other in a manner that is not reducible to a more inclusive, self-forgiving process. Now, again, some of you may think that's... Uh, that's at the core of Hegel's whole logic also, to what extent this between is kept genuinely open and how it is intermediated and how Hegel intermediates it. And um, Hegel is more, more rich and complex than the Kojevian version of, of Hegel, of course, I think. But Kojev is very powerful precisely because it's a kind of, it's a simplified Hegelianism of sorts that stresses negativity being towards death, struggle, and so on. And it draws our attention uh, uh, more easily than some of the uh, more dialectical subtleties of Hegel himself. But yeah, I, the, man, many of these points are illuminating for me also in terms of being able to see Girard better. Uh, so my thanks to you. Very good, thank you. Um, so we have just over 10 minutes. If you would like to ask a question, um, you'll just have to walk up to the microphone here and uh, we can begin with yourself, sir, if you'd like. Thank you very much for your paper. What excited me most was your reference to Emerson that imitation is uh, suicide and it reminded me of the Sufi uh, reflections on imitation. I don't know if there is an influence of Sufism on Emerson, but the Sufis were very much against imitation, although in Rumi you find a very interesting passage that matches perfectly what, what I understood what you said. It says, 
the oyster, the oyster in the beginning has to imitate. But as soon as the pearl inside forms, imitation is no longer uh, uh, necessary. So the, the oyster, the, uh, the shell is the protection and uh, so the, the development uh, gets you beyond imitation. So that's a very interesting coincidence between Emerson and, and your unfolding and the Sufi tradition. Yeah, that's a very uh, uh, appropriate point to make. I mean, in, 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 in my own view, the part of the difficulty is just a kind of a dyadic view of being for self and being in relation to the other. And you could make the argument that we begin to be for ourselves by first being in relation to the other. We become ourselves because we are enabled to become ourselves through this mimetic intermediation with others. And there can come a point where we can stand with a certain, I would say, relative independence uh, in relation to what has enabled us to be. And it's the relative character of the independence that is full of equivocation in the early statements of Emerson, in any case, since there seems to be just a, a cutting of the relation to the other. And I think that that's, uh, Emerson is uh, symptomatic of... Uh, Emerson's much more complicated thinker than our culture at large, but it's that side of it that has, to a degree, uh, ex exerted influence. In later writings, um, uh, Emerson, and I have it in a footnote here, if you look at the full text, uh, you can see tremors in uh, Emerson's own statements. But later he goes out of his way to say, true self-reliance is reliance on God. So the sense of an immeasurable other comes back into the picture, which entirely changes the meaning of imitation being suicide when you bring in. So, so, see, so he himself modified uh, statements. And there were statements indeed made in the context of the civil war, for instance, where our impossibly intricated relationship with all the others could not be denied. But yeah, the Sufi connection, that's very interesting. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't speak as an Emersonian scholar in that particular view, but he himself, as you know, was certainly open in a more ecumenical sense to, to uh, Indian philosophy and other religious traditions beyond Christianity. Thank you, Professor Desmond. I learned a lot from your talk. I want to ask about the liability of mimesis and the danger that it prevents to theology. So in Aristotle's Metaphysics Book 13, he offers a quick distinction between the Pythagorean mimesis and Platonic mythexis. And he argues that Platonism is essentially distinguished by the participation in a self-identical or self-exemplary idea that is absent from the Pythagoreans. And we find also in Plato's Ion a devastating critique of the accelerating and indeterminate mimesis of the poets. Um, I find in Plato's dialogues that there seems to be a progression from a use of drama that is mimetic in the early dialogues to an emphasis upon division or dialectics, and finally to a, uh, a way of grounding the possibility of imitation in the self-exemplary ideas that you find, for instance, in the Sophists and the Timaeus. What I want to ask is whether the development of the syllogism, and specifically the way in which those divisions can be shown to produce a conclusion of necessity, provides us with a more certain ground of thinking about not only the, the imitation of things, but also how that indeterminate alterity of mimesis can be not only canceled but sustained from a self-grounding idea, and whether you would say that, um, that, that scientific knowledge is incompatible with this mimetic acceleration. Um, just one last thing, you said that what begins with an image can appear as an original, and I would ask if the way that we come to know things scientifically provides us with a sense of, of certain necessary knowledge that doesn't cancel but is complementary to that accelerating mimetic desire. Yeah, there's a lot, I mean, how much is in that? I, have I another hour to talk? Uh, no, no, but I, I, I think actually that um, uh, metexis and mimesis should not be, in the end, separated from each other in a platonic context. In fact, I, in, in my own paper, I think the sense of mimesis that I give is inseparable from a sense of participation when you bring into play notions like the betweening, this dynamic betweening. So there's a, there, there is the basis for a reformulated platonism of metexis in the remarks that I have made. On the ion, I would be actually a bit more... Uh, in my own paper, I actually do talk about mania as well as eros as two ways of traversing the chorismos between 
one side and the other. And I see in the ion a certain cautious attitude towards the inspiration of the rhapsode, but not uh, an outright rejection. That in that particular dialogue, uh, Socrates is, um, there is a kind of rationalistic worry that inspiration cannot really intellectually account for itself. But when you look at something like the Phaedrus as dealing with divine mania, you get an entirely richer world in relation to the fact that nothing great in human existence is possible without divine mania. So I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't see Plato as a kind of a rationalist prude, so to say, in relation to mania. In relation to Aristotle, I, 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 the thing that worries me about Aristotle is that even though he says that being is analogous, there's something in the tilt of his mind that would like university if he could possibly find it in terms of a more precise, determinate formulation of the nature of things. To be is to be a determinist somewhat. And if you, if you absolutize the notion of determinate being, you can't really do justice to all of the kinds of phenomena that we're dealing with here. So Aristotle is a puzzle on that particular score. And I also think that, as, as was quoted, the desire to know in Aristotle and, um, in, and in, uh, in, in Lonergan, neither Lonergan nor Aristotle actually gives us, a, a, so to say, a, an archaeology of desire itself. It's a, we, we, we were marked by the desire to know, but that's astonishing that we're marked by the desire to know, asking us, asking us as philosophers to ask, well, what the hell is the meaning of this desire? Not just simply in terms of the teleology of wanting to know things, but in terms of out of what origins and enabling sources it comes to be. And that, that's, that's part of the intention in talking about this porosity of being, uh, to take that step back into the enabling sources of desire itself. But your, your questions are great questions, no question about it. Thank you. Uh, William, I was very interested sort of in the way in which you complicated mimesis insofar as mimesis can be improvisation uh, because of sourcing. Um, the, the question I think sort of that um, I want to ask is, um, how would we know the limits sort of, you know, of improvisation which has got to do with sourcing and sort of the way in which Emerson indexes things? So let me give you the threshold and the fault line. Uh, Coleridge and Biographia Literaria, uh, book 13 or chapter, not quite sure, it's a book or chapter 13. It's a famous chapter in any event on the imagination. And he says that imagination is uh, the repetition in the finite of the infinite I am. So now you've got repetition, uh, but now you've got the I am. So there's your threshold, and it's also your fault line. Yeah. Uh, how do we distinguish? Yeah, but I mean that you bring in Coleridge is very interesting because Coleridge is more explicit in that particular passage about the, the relativity between one's own finite creativity and the more absolute source of uh, creation. I think that within the sources of German idealism to which he was indebted, Schelling especially, I mean he plagiarized Schelling. Schelling actually refers to the, my dear friend Coleridge who stole my stuff, but because he's such a nice guy, that's okay. I mean, people don't know that, but I, I think the legacy of German idealism from that point of view is more present in Emerson, where that sense of difference and the traversal of that difference doesn't get named as explicitly as it should. But I don't think that there's any determinate boundary that one could actually lay out precisely because this is, this is a porosity and a porosity is almost nothing. Even the word porosity is not a very good metaphor because you, if, you, if something is porous, we sometimes think of it as something through which something passes it makes it determinate, but here we're dealing with a kind of pure passage of a sort that is, in my view, best described in language that is, I suppose, apophatic, but something passes, like the breath. And uh, doesn't uh, Coleridge have a 
poem about the Aeolian wind and, and so on, which, which, which is trying to capture that. But I think Coleridge is still in the shadow of German idealism from the point of view he says something to the effect that um, uh, about nature uh, and in our life nature lives, that we, uh, somehow we have to give her its life and it's, 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 our, it's also our, sh it's our wedding gown but also our shroud. But the feeling is that if we don't breathe into nature, then it, as it were, falls back into the dead mechanism, so to say, of the Newtonian uh, thereness. So I don't think in his writing also he's really worked out what might be fully at stake in an articulated metaxology between the, the absolutely original source and our own, originate, ori our own originative uh, powers. But he's, the, I mean, it's, you're very right to just, the, t the two I ams, and that, but the, the middle space between the original absolute I am and I am. But in all fairness then to, to, but to, to Emerson, 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 I do think, repented of attitudes that could be taken in this more merely self-assertive way uh, uh, in his own uh, thought and writing. Thank you very much. Uh, it's probably this question is probably more for uh, Dr. Kaplan. Just in terms of the uh, interdividual subject relative to Girard's uh, mimesis, um, and the connection that you're making with the, uh, Dr. Desmond's poro porosity of being the in, uh, the, the uh, betweenness. Um, I, I'm just interested because, uh, like, and maybe it comes back to the question of the other. Uh, this kind of shades of Levinas here, but um, I, I'm wondering, uh, yeah, what, the Gerard says at the end of the Deceit Desire, the, the novel, that um, the, the converted, the, the, the one who realizes that they're uh, imitating, uh, they, they worship on, uh, on their knees in front of the other. Um, but it seems that the, the porosity here that I'm hearing in terms of the in-betweenness that Dr. Desmond is talking about has to do with a kind of inner self, a kind of interiority that's redeemable in a sense. Um, but we're not there yet with, with a lot of Girard's kind of reflections on mimesis. So there's a kind of tension between the inner and the outer there, between the, the self and the other, that Girard seems to kind of almost evacuate the self in, in the early work. So that that, that kind of interiority is, is very diminished, that the agent has very little, very, there's very little that they can rely on in terms of uh, their action to, to kind of bring them to any kind of uh, sense of kind of, uh, I suppose, being in the world which I hear from Dr. Desmond's sense of uh, reflecting on the betweenness. So the betweenness, I think, enters into right, the self. So the, the Augustinian idea of going in and, uh, and, and kind of somehow, uh, whatever wretchedness we find there, we also find something good. Um, it's very hard to kind of capture or find that in early, uh, certainly early Girard. And, uh, apart from, of course, his own biography, uh, we don't get much that uh, kind of can kind of capture that idea um, that gives us, uh, I suppose, hope for the connection between what uh, Dr. Desmond is talking about in terms of porosity being a kind of way of kind of reaching beyond and kind of gaining some kind of ground. Anyway, kind of question there for, for maybe a for both of you, but maybe Dr. Kaplan. Uh, yeah, I, if I don't want to keep people from the cof coffee hour, so just I would, I would just say, you know, one of the biblical passages that Gerard finds um, most helpful is in Paul's letter to the Corinthians when he says, "Be imitators of me, as an I, I as an as I am an imitator of Christ," and that's your identity. You know, Galatians two twenty. I have been crucified in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I mean, there's no, the, the metaphor of inner and outward, it, it breaks down. Um, 
uh, and the, the, I, I, I read the porosity um, metaphor as, as getting at that breaking down, but I mean, you, you clarified what you meant by porosity in a, in a helpful way, and maybe that brings them closer to Gerard, or what you said about porosity closer to Gerard, or maybe not. I mean, I don't think that there is something like porosity in uh, Girard as an explicitly articulated idea, but it's presupposed by what he says about mimesis and many other things. It's presupposed in any true understanding of what it means to be a desiring creature, what it means to be intersubjective. You were connecting it with the intersubjective, but that already presupposes that there's this open space between subject and subject. And your point about the interior between that the Augustinian, you know, from the exterior to the interior, but that's only not just exterior and interior with Augustine, it's also between inferior and superior. As you know, he describes the movement of his thinking from the outside to the inside, but from the inferior to the superior, and that's that vertical line of transcending is absolutely crucial to establishing uh, his own relationship to God and God's relationship to the the interior person. It's much more like, uh, 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 someone like Augustine is, is, is very, is profoundly reflective of these crossings in the between, whether horizontal or vertical. Uh, Girard has the genius on hitting on things. And when he hits on things, he gives an articulation that has a certain spiritual depth to it that is often very lacking in literary critics and you know credentialed intellectuals in our own day. And that's why I think Gerard deserves great honor. It's certainly one of the reasons anyway. But I don't think he has that reflective philosophical he's he's not he's not he's not philosophical in this I'm not saying that you have to have a system, but you sometimes have to think a little bit more systematically about what's at play to do justice to the richness of the poetic intermediations. But that wasn't his, that wasn't his vocation, so to say, that's, and that's the way it is. So, thank you very much. That brings our first session to a close. Please join me in thanking again Dr. Desmond and Dr. Kaplan. Thanks.